Hello. So most of you who've been around for a little while uh, probably know me, but for those that you don't, uh, my name is Jason Ekstrand. I am a software developer at Intel. Um, for the last four years, I have been working on, uh, uh, well, three and a half. I've been working on our Vulkan efforts, um, and at this point, I'm more or less leading that, and I'm one of our uh, representatives at the Kronos Vulkan Working Group. Um, so this talk is mostly to present something that the Kronos Vulcan Working Group has been working on um, to try and improve the, uh, improve the Vulcan API around the area of synchronization, and then to start a sort of breakout discussion with some of the various uh, user space and kernel developers here to try and figure out a, a unified idea of how we're going to actually implement it. So first of all, um, let's start off a bit with the current status of Vulkan semaphores. So semaphores in Vulkan are the uh, primary synchronization object for synchronizing GPU to GPU dependencies. Uh, in order to deal with some use cases and co some corner cases, uh, semaphores have a fairly strict set of limitations. In particular, they require a very strict signal weight, signal weight, signal weight pattern on the semaphore object. Um, you cannot trigger a semaphore in one submission and then wait on it for multiple submissions. Um, you can't wait on it and then wait on it again before it's been signaled again. Um, the signal operation has to be, the, the, the work that's going to signal the semaphore has to be in queued before the work that's going to wait on the semaphore. Um, and it's only for GPU to GPU weights. You can't do a CPU weight on a semaphore. We have fences for that. And so we have this kind of awkward uh, two synchronization primitive thing, even though in most people's actual kernel drivers, everything is a DMA fence anyway, and there's no real reason to have the separation. The, a lot of the, the separation and the restrictions and the awkwardness that resulted was to try and get a bunch of corner cases right without specifically implying an implementation, which is, um, something that the Kronos group, whether unfortunately or not, has to do. Um, and in our, for instance, in the, I think most of the Linux drivers, um, at least the Mesa ones, um, if you break any of these rules, the consequences are pretty mundane. Um, if you try and wait on a semaphore that hasn't been signaled, the kernel will just harmlessly reject the batch. If you do multiple weights, it just works. Um, but the spec is very, very strict about these things in order to allow for other implementations that aren't based on DMA fence and might have different behavior around certain corner cases. Um, in particular, there was a significant discussion early on about when does the semaphore get reset so that you can signal it again. And trying to make all those things well-defined led to uh, this kind of awkward uh, set of restrictions. And um, also another thing that Kronos has to deal with that we don't usually hear is that they have to make APIs that work on Windows, they work on Linux, they work on random embedded platforms. And so they, they have to kind of spec around things a bit. And we're trying to fix the, the awkwardness, but it's taken some time. So, um, Let's just give an example and show where this gets weird. So suppose we have an app, and it's got three threads. It's got a 3D rendering loop that runs once per frame. It's got a physics model thread that runs once every five milliseconds. And it's got some upload thread that happens on demand. So you walk around a corner, and suddenly there's a new tree, and we have to upload the data. Um, so how does synchronization work between these threads with the current model? So the upload thread is pretty straightforward. It gets some resources from some CPU side queue and um, that need to be uploaded. It creates some command buffers that upload them. It s creates a semaphore. It submits to a DMA queue or to a graphics queue or a compute queue, something that has blitz. And then it notifies the render thread and says, here's my semaphore. Go ahead and use the resources as soon as the semaphore is done. Um, the render thread is also pretty straightforward. So we grab a snapshot from the physics thread. That happens somehow. Um, we get our fresh upload data and the semaphores associated with it. We build our command buffers. We grab a semaphore. We queue submit. 
We hand that semaphore off to Windows System Integration, and it goes and does its thing. Where things get interesting is the physics thread. So we, you know, the player is running around with a controller. They get information from the controller. They start updating the physics model. They build some command buffers. They get a semaphore. They submit the thread. And then they run into a conundrum. Um, what do I do with the semaphore? If I, if the render thread wants to use it, I can hand it off to the render thread. Everything works great. If the render thread wants to use it twice, for some reason, because there was a frame glitch or something, all of a sudden I can't do that because I just used the semaphore for a wait operation and I need a new semaphore in order to get another wait operation. Or if the render thread isn't going to use it, then I don't have anything that's going to wait on it, so I can't ever signal it again, so I have to throw it away. And it gets very awkward for the application to be able to, to actually deal with these things because of this very, very strict signal wait, signal wait, signal wait that we have um, implied in the API. Um, there's also questions of when can you actually destroy a semaphore because you have the semaphore, you've signaled it, nobody is actually ever going to wait on it, so when is it free to destroy? Because you can't destroy it while the work is still pending to trigger it, but um, so now you have to do like a dummy submit that waits on the semaphore and doesn't do any work but triggers a fence and then you wait on the fence and then you can destroy the semaphore and it's just kind of a gnarly mess to try and deal with from an application perspective. So one solution to this is just to tell the application, well, that's your problem, pass more messages. And the application can do additional communication so the render thread can notify the physics thread and tell it which ones it's using and can preferably tell it early enough that the physics thread cannot bother creating the semaphore if the render thread is not going to use it. And then we, when we do this, we add a bunch of latency, we add a bunch of message passing, more round trips through the kernel for mutexes, and it's not good for performance. Um, it's painful for the application to write because it's piles and piles of message passing, and it's painful for trying to do efficiently because you really need to be, be working speculatively in your different threads to try and guess what the other one is doing because you don't want to wait until the last possible minute to make those decisions because as soon, if you do that, then all of a sudden you're going to introduce additional latency into the system. Um, so telling the application just to pass more messages isn't really a good solution to the problem. Um, so what we've been working on for probably a year, I would say this has been ongoing for around a year now, um, I don't remember the exact details, is trying to work on a better solution to this, a better synchronization primitive, something that will work better for application developers. Um, we've talked to a lot of different application developers um, at various different game houses. Um, we've looked at different synchronization models um, that are available in other APIs. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about what different people can actually implement um, and trying to come up with something that is feasible to do in a cross-vendor from a GPU perspective and also cross-platform from an operating system perspective way that is going to provide a synchronization model that the uh, application developers will actually want to use. Um, the result of that discussion has been something we call uh, timelines or timeline semaphores. So the idea behind timelines is that instead of having this sort of internally one-shot semaphore that gets swapped out and then reset, each timeline carries along with it a 60, an incrementing 64-bit value. Um, when you sit, it starts, everything starts off at zero, and when you signal the semaphore, it increases that counter to some other 64-bit value. And in the API that we've come up with, the uh, value, the new value is chosen by whoever signals it. So you don't necessarily have to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You can go 0, 5, 7, 13. Um, and it, so it provides a little bit of flexibility there. Um, the signaler is required to make sure that it actually does increase every time. But... Um, Wait operations, uh, instead of simply waiting on whatever the last thing was, wait for the semaphore to hit a particular value. So you can have 
a one thread that is rendering and incrementing the sum of four by one every single time, and you can have another thread that waits for every third. Um, one of the things that this implies, which is kind of controversial, um, is it implies that wait before signal behavior is well defined. So you can have, so you can have one client that submits work to wait on um, time point 75, and then another client that's still working on time point 60, 61, 62, and then once that client actually gets around to submitting the work that triggers time point 75, then the work from client A will actually go through to the GPU. So you don't have to have the two clients in nearly as tight of communication um, as long as they've both agreed on which time point they're going to synchronize on. Um, another thing that we're doing with this API is that we're unifying the fence and semaphore. Uh, the timelines are going to be weightable from the CPU as well as from the GPU. So currently, you kind of have this awkward thing where you have to create time you have to create semaphores, one semaphore for every waiter on a particular thing, um, and then you also have to create a fence if you want to be able to wait on it from the CPU. And when it comes to uh, timeline destruction, or semaphore destruction, you have to have a fence to go along with your semaphore so you can wait on the fence so that you know when to destroy the semaphore. And <laughs> it's kind of a mess. So uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're also unifying the GPU and CPU weights. So the new thing is going to be uh, waitable from the CPU as well. With the usual, you wait on a particular time point and uh, you have a timeout and if the time point never occurs, then it naturally times out and everything works just fine. Um, Another thing is that just like all of the other Vulkan synchronization primitives, these will be shareable across processes. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we have kernel implications is because if this was all within one process, we could just fake it behind the user's back with um, mutexes and condition variables and that sort of thing. But um, with having to share these things as a single file descriptor across processes, we really do need some sort of kernel support. So why do, like, what does this bring us? Um, brings us a number of things. Uh, for one thing, there's a lot of use cases that were previously either not possible or not really easy to spec. Um, so signal after signal, wait after wait, just work. Um, you can wait on old time points that have been signaled hours ago. Um, you can signal something twice with nobody waiting on it. You can wait on something twice with nobody signaling, signaling it because everything is based on these time points and not based on this implicit Boolean that's sort of inside the semaphore. Um, you can wait on previous signal operations. Like I said, you can, even though the, semaphore, the timeline might be at time point 70, you can wait on time point 65 if you really want to. Um, doing so will mean your work gets executed immediately, but it's a valid thing to do and it's well defined what the behavior there is. Um, signal before wait is also well defined, like I said. Um, it gives us this unification, and it's also significantly easier for developers. Um, instead of having to have these, you know, creating semaphores constantly or having semaphore reuse pools, uh, developers can now just replace most of those with like a single timeline per thread. It's a lot fewer objects to track, it's a lot less reuse issues, um, it's a lot simpler. Um, in our previous example, which I'll get to in a second, each thread has its own timeline and you aren't constantly creating semaphores. So let's look at our example. What does this look like in the new world of timelines? So in the new world of timelines, each one of those three threads would simply have a timeline associated with it. Um, we wouldn't be passing the semaphores back and forth constantly. We would just create the time, all three timelines up front, share them between the three threads, and we would agree on the values that are, we're waiting on, but we wouldn't have to share the actual objects. Um, so for instance, the, in the physics thread, for instance, wouldn't have to care about uh, which semaphores are actually going to be used. Um, it does care about uh, which sort of physics snapshots that it produces are being used because it has to deal with recycling. But um, when it comes to the semaphores, it can just signal the timeline every single time and it never has to worry about is this trigger ever going to actually be waited on and deal with that mess. It just triggers it and then some of them get waited on, some of them don't, it's easy. Um, Message passing gets suddenly a lot simpler. Instead of having to pass objects around using um, mutexes and all of this stuff, you can just have a 64-bit atomic. And 
the physics thread can go along and it can just say, here's my latest snapshot number. Um, the uh, threads can more easily check on progress of other threads as well, because if the, um, the rendering thread, for instance, wants to know what's the last time point that the physics thread finished, it can just query the object and say, what's the last time point that finished? And, it will, and then it can know the progress of other threads without having to necessarily talk to those other threads and ask those threads, what fences have you most recently waited on and all of that mess. It's, it's just far, far simpler. Um, and timeline values can be descriptive, which is kind of a unintended side effect, but it's kind of cool. Um, so for instance, the physics thread could make its timeline values mean milliseconds. And since you're probably not likely to run out of milliseconds from the start of the application in any time soon, you can make the, it actually have a descriptive meaning. Um, not, like I said, not really an intended feature, but it is kind of neat. So first of all, um, so, th so this talk is kind of divided into two halves. Uh, first half, that's what timelines are. Um, and then the second half is going to, we're going to talk a little bit about what we do to implement them. But before we do that, do we have any questions about what timelines are and sort of the implications from the, the Vulkan API perspective? And do we have somebody with a microphone? Any question? In the back. Hi. So how are the timelines going to interact with the existing API? So not, for example, now we have APIs that accept fences and, uh, you know, semaphores. Will you be able to just pass timelines or will you create new APIs for the same commands? Right. So that's a good question. Um, the current plan, which may change, I can't um, guarantee that this is the way it's finally going to work out. But the current plan is that we're strapping them onto the side of semaphores. So when you go and create a semaphore, there will be a create flag, and you can say, please make this a timeline semaphore. And then all of the things which currently wait on or trigger semaphores will also take a uint 64 t parameter that is the value to increment it to or the value to wait on. Um, so it's not going to be too invasive into the API. But applications which want to use it will certainly have to change their behavior because um, they'll have to start passing them in. And I think we're going to mis just make it invalid to treat a timeline semaphore as if it's a regular semaphore and vice versa. Um, so like if you create it with a flag, you always have to provide the 64-bit value. And if you don't create it with a flag, you never can. Um, does, does that answer the question? More questions? Okay, that's all. All right, uh, so, uh, what's that? Uh, remember that tomorrow morning we have a uh, workshop uh, about uh, timeline semaphores. Uh, just talk to uh, Jason and uh, just discuss with him all the details of this. So, part two. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion. Um, so, this, this was split into to two parts on request of some of our friends at Kronos who didn't want me to make it sound like Kronos was trying to spec how the Linux kernel is supposed to work. So, whatever. Um, so, part two. Uh, the question that comes up next is how do we actually implement this thing? So currently in the kernel, we have these DMA fences, and they're a one-shot object that gets created when a, something is submitted, and they get passed around a variety of ways, including implicitly attached to gem buffers, uh, put into sync objects, put into sync files, or fence FDs if you're on Android. Um, and we need to figure out some way to actually implement this new programming model on top of what we have in the Linux kernel. And so we've had a bunch of discussions uh, internally at Intel and also with uh, various other people who are in the position of having to implement this. Um, 
And in, in my mind, there's sort of three basic categories of options. Uh, the first option is kernel magic. So we have a kernel driver, it can do lots of things. Um, one of those things it could in theory do is just hold all of that work in some queue somewhere until the time point that comes along with all the dependent fences actually materialize and we have something that we can submit and then we actually submit it to the GPU and everything works. Um, this comes with quite a few problems. So the first problem is this question of sort of resource management. When do you commit the resources? So currently, um, at least on 9.15, exec buff does not return until we are very sure that we can actually execute the batch. But if we have a signal before wait behavior, or wait before signal behavior, suddenly we can't do that anymore because we don't know if the batch is actually ever going to execute and we need to be, and things are going to stay in the, the, the kernel queue a lot longer. So we have so a lot of questions about resource management. Um, currently, like I said, we're doing it in, sort of in the exec call. We could also um, wait until later, but if we wait until later, then we have all sorts of error handling issues of what do you do to the client if suddenly you decide later on that actually we ran out of memory. Do you, what, how, how, what do you give that feedback back to the client? The client's already submitted it, it already thinks it worked. Um, there's also some significant issues around overcommitted scenarios. So today, if you have too many resources on the, uh, that you're trying to use on the GPU than actually fit, we can kind of deal with those scenarios by just waiting until enough stuff is done that we can shuffle stuff out, shuffle the new stuff in, execute the batch, and off we go. But if we're in this scenario where you have uh, the wait before signal behavior, suddenly we can't do that anymore because you might submit something that's dependent on something that hasn't been submitted and that uses three quarters of your VRAM and then you submit another thing that's the thing that's supposed to trigger it and that uses three quarters of your VRAM and now you've got one and a half times your VRAM burned and you can't, sub you can't s actually submit the second thing to unblock the first thing because the first thing is using the resources needed by the second thing and you have a disaster. Um, there's also, there's a pile of other places where wait before signal can end up in deadlock um, because you can theoretically have something that waits on something that waits on the first thing and you can end up in deadlock scenarios so we would need code to try and break deadlock. Um, there's all sorts of fallout that would happen as we try to refit TTM in the 915 memory management to try and handle all of these things. That's going to introduce piles of bugs and piles of churn. Um, there's also another issue which I didn't really think about much until Daniel Vetto pointed it out to me on IRC the other day. Um, and that is that it's virtually impossible to keep these sort of future fences, these signal before wait dependencies from leaking through implicit synchronization into other drivers. So right now in the kernel we have um, this implicit synchronization where if one device writes to a buffer, then all other reads wait on that write implicitly. And this is depended on for X11 and Wayland in order to synchronize between the client and the server. And preventing, and we also use it internally for a bunch of memory management stuff. So for instance, uh, when we're trying to page clients in and out, we use those implicit fences to make sure that we do the paging correctly. Um, Preventing these things from leaking, uh, pre preventing any sort of a future fence or an unmaterialized fence from leaking through the implicit synchronization and causing problems for other drivers is very difficult. Um, it's all well and good to say we'll do this as kernel magic and the Intel driver can support this behavior because we have an awesome GPU scheduler and it's gonna be great, but preventing somebody from submitting some work that's going to deadlock in the Intel driver and then telling AMD's driver to wait on it and causing problems for them is a very difficult problem to solve. And the conclusion that Daniel and I came to is that it's basically impossible to prevent the fences from leaking without effectively rewriting the DRM subsystem. Um, it could be done, it's just a lot of work and a lot of churn. So, option two, rewrite the DRM subsystem. Um, so another thing that's been suggested is that we could follow the path of certain other APIs and sort of separate resource management from synchronization and push a lot of the resource management off on the client. Um, what this would look like, I'm not sure, but it would probably look something like 
the user space drivers would basically request that so certain resources be made resident, and then they would go to submit their batch, and if the kernel has evicted something when they submit their batch, the kernel then rejects it and tells them to go make things resident and try again, and um, if, the, if you do submit a bunch of stuff that deadlocks and the kernel ma can't make progress on any of it, it just rejects the whole lot and the user space clients have to go try again. And something like this can work. Um, there are other platforms that do this and it works very well for them. But it's also in, involves entirely rewriting the DRM subsystem. So <laughs> it's not a real good short term option. Um, so the option three, which is more or less uh, jointly proposed by AMD and Intel, um, kind of independently, is to sort of do a hybrid thing where the kernel provides just enough additional primitives that user space can depend, that user space can implement it. Um, so the basic idea in my mind, and I think there's a few differences, there's a few subtle differences between my imagination of how this works and the current AMD patches that are sitting on the DOI develop mailing list. Um, but the basic idea is that we would extend sync object and um, you would add these U64 serials that get incremented when you signal and they get uh, weighted on. And then we would extend a, a few of the ioctals a little bit. So if the kernel ever gets into a situation where user space has asked it to wait on a time point that doesn't exist yet, um, then there's two options. One is we can just wait in the exec call in the kernel. Another option is that the kernel can just reject it and tell user space to try again when it's ready. Um, my preference is for the, the second one, but another thing is that we'll extend the, uh, we'll add a new query ioctal to say, to, so that the, we can ask the, kernel what is the latest time point for this particular sync object so that you can easily know where things are at from user space and then ex extend the wait ioctal to wait for a particular time point. Um, in particular, wait for it to complete or become available and then user space drivers will have to have a uh, submit thread that allows them to hold off the work until the kernel is ready for it. Um, so there's a there's a few details that need to be worked out here. Uh, one of those details is sort of whether this waiting happens in the kernel or happens in user space. Um, so I think the current AMD patches, if the timeline is not yet ready, the exact call will just block until all of the dependencies are in place and then we'll continue. Um, another option is that we can have uh, the wait ioctal have sort of two modes, one where it waits for the sync object to complete, and another where it simply waits for the dependencies to become sort of available um, or materialized, where the dependent work is not yet done, but all of the dependent work required to, say, to trigger that point has been submitted. Um, and at that point in time, we know that it's safe for the kernel to wait on it because the work has been submitted and we know that it will complete in finite time. Um, so, if we did that, then we, the user space thread could simply block until the time point, until all the time points have materialized and then submit to the kernel. And we don't have to be blocking inside the kernel for an indeterminate amount of time. Um, that's my preference on the implementation, but there's some details to discuss there. Uh, but so far, both us and the AMD people have basically come up with the same idea, and that is that Doing this in the kernel is not feasible <laughs> and we need to do it in user space and have a thread. Um, so that is the end of part two. Does anybody have any answers? <laughs> or questions, I'll take those two. Uh, I, I don't really have an answer, but um, <laughs> I, I did look at the patches and it's actually the case that the patches that are on the list, it's as far as I understand them optional whether you wait or not, which I think is a good idea because it gives user space different options of implementing this. And I think we should look precisely at this, like what are the variants of, of user space to actually do things because when you're 
managing multiple queues, for example, there is a question, well, do you, do you spawn one thread per queue or do you have one thread where everything gets postponed to? Like I could imagine in order to avoid a context switch in the, in the fast path, you want to do kind of a, a, a tentative submit that doesn't wait in the application thread. And then if that fails, you push it off for the other thread to pick it up potentially. And I, I, think, I think there are probably a, a, a few gaps in the current patches still to make both of those variants work and maybe we should just look at those tomorrow. Yeah. The, um, yeah, we, we probably do want some sort of a, a speculative submit. Um, and there's some question as to, uh, yeah, having the, having the, at least the core kernel bits support both wait inside of the kernel and just reject is probably a good idea. The other thing I didn't mention here is that we also have to deal with exactly the same issue um, with sync file export because uh, in order to be able to work on particularly Android and also if we do um, explicit sync stuff through Wayland or X11, we need to be able to export sync object or sync files and sync files have the finite return guarantee. So at some point in time when the client d asks for a sync file to be exported from it, its semaphore, uh, we have to block inside the client and wait for everything to be materialized before we can actually export the sync file. Um, and again, there's some questions, do we do, I don't do that in kernel, do we want to do that in user space? Um, the other thing with multiple queues that I've been thinking about that gets kind of sticky um, is the current wait ioctal has two modes. It's got wait for all or wait for any. And what you really want if you have multiple queues with one thread is wait for all of, uh, wait for any of all, <laughs> wait for all of any, <laughs> depending on how you want to specify it, where basically you have these groups and you want for, to wait for any of the groups to complete, but the group doesn't complete until all of it completes. Um, so there's some API weirdness that we would have to get sorted out in order to be able to make the single thread thing really work. How many queues can submit to a semaphore and or increment it and how do you synchronize the so you don't say submit five on one and four on the other and then they complete out of order? That's the client's problem. <laughs> um, so so for instance, if you have um, something where one client submits, let's say the, the submission pattern ends up being, you know, five, six, seven, nine, eight, something like that. Um, I think the Vulkan API would say that that's just illegal. Okay. Um, I think in our implementation in the kernel, the best thing to do would be to say that basically the submit to eight does nothing because somebody already incremented it to nine. Okay, okay. Um, or maybe if somehow you have multiple queues and the submit to eight actually completes before the submit to nine, it would make a difference, but um, I think the best thing for us to do is just to um, try and handle that case as best as we can. Um, we might discover that that's not practical, in which case we'll have to revisit it. But oh. I don't see any more hands, so. Maybe people is, is hungry for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thanks, Jason. Thank you.